Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. I'll be starting in about a minute, uh, but I just want to check in first to make sure that you're in the right webinar. Uh, if you're here for a panel discussion on the future of business and technology, that's this Sunday evening. If you're here for a panel discussion on the future of AI, that's next Thursday. And if you're here to talk about uh, the future of financial services, that's a month's time, so you've got plenty of time to wait. Uh, this evening, I, or evening here in London, I'm really going to be talking you through the report that we're producing on the future of meetings, events, travel, tourism, hotels and hospitality, which will actually be released on Monday. And I'll give it another couple of seconds to let people join and then we'll get straight into it. Uh, please do ask questions throughout. There's a Q&A box for you to put your questions into and please vote for the questions you see in there that you'd most like to see answered. If you just want to have a chat with the other participants, please put your comments in the chat box. I won't see those because I'll be focusing on the screen and the Q&A box and so I won't see any of your chat but I'll see it afterwards. And uh, yeah, just make sure you put your Q&A in the Q&A box and then we'll try and answer as many of those questions at the end as possible. The scheduled start time is 7 p.m. UK, but if there's still a lot of people around and a lot of questions, I'm happy to carry on for a few minutes after that for whoever wants to stay around. So I think we've got a, we've got a, a nice uh, audience gathering, so it's probably a good time for me to get going with the presentation to make sure we've got plenty of time for questions afterwards. And as I say, this session is really looking at scenarios and strategies for the future of all these sectors, drawing on the report that we're going to be launching early next week. And where do we start? Well, we're in a set of sectors where we live on optimism. We're, we're a sector or a group of sectors that thrive on bringing people together, on creating incredible human experiences and creating connection and particularly for the meetings and events sectors, for enabling business to happen, for enable, enabling value to be created, for enabling learning experiences to happen. And all of that has been turned upside down. In, in the past, in previous downturns, we've known how to navigate through them. We've known how to drive business, how to generate new demand, and how to get to the other side of the downturn. And we're a very optimistic industry, so we tend to focus on the upside. But now we're in a situation where we're facing a factor that we've never really had to deal with before, a, a major health crisis over which we have almost no control. So it doesn't matter how hard we hope or how much we wish for the economic upturn and business to return to normal, we know in our hearts of hearts that until there's a vaccine available, we're not going to return to the normality of travel and tourism, of people consuming hotels and hospitality, or people wanting to create and attend live events in a normal manner. And so we're having to redefine who we are as businesses in this uncertain and rapidly changing world and having to think really hard about how do we generate the revenues to keep ourselves going in a world where we no longer know the rules and we don't know how it's going to play out from day to day. And so I'm going to be drawing on the book that we've just launched called Aftershocks and Opportunities, Scenarios for a Post-Pandemic Future. There we pulled together 25 future thinkers from around the world who contributed 28 chapters and it took us just 10 weeks to do this. We started it in March, on March the 20th we put the call out and we launched the book on June the 1st. And there's an incredible array of ideas covering four different domains. So critical shifts and scenarios that are taking place or that could emerge, the implications for society and social policy, the future of government and the economy, and finally the future of business and technology. And I'll be weaving in ideas from all of those to help us think about how do we navigate our way through this and what strategies can we adopt. And what I see is that for the sectors we're talking about, there are three critical challenges that our report addresses and I'm going to be talking about today. The first is, how do we make sure that we're preparing for a range of possible scenarios, 
not just the one that looks most attractive to us. Secondly, what can we do to anticipate, understand, and then create practical responses to the shifts that are happening in our world that could be temporary, that could be permanent, but that we have to deal with? And finally, how do we make sure that we're learning enough, we're flexible enough, and we're experimental enough as core skills in our organization now? that these are becoming the core operating system for our business so that we can flex and adapt to whatever might happen. And what we know is that if we look out there, there are a whole set of different forces and factors which are hugely uncertain from the level of demand to what will the level of infections and mortality be to how will business evolve, what will un the level of unemployment be, what will people's attitudes be to traveling again, is a huge number. And so there are many different ways in which they could combine and create different possible outcomes. It's impossible to predict all the possible outcomes, but what we can do is create scenarios. And scenarios are a very powerful tool for making sense of uncertainty and helping us explore the different ways things could play out and therefore effectively rehearsing the future and identifying what strategies and tactics we might adopt under any scenario so we can be better prepared for whatever might happen. And in order to really explore this for the book and for this report, we've looked at four scenarios using what's called a driving force model, where you identify the most uncertain and most impactful forces and then explore how they might interact. And for us, the two key forces here are firstly, how the pandemic evolves, where we see a spectrum from poor containment through to eradication on a global scale. And the other big driving force is the nature of the economic recovery from a deep and prolonged downturn through to some, something like a strong economic rebound. And that gives us four possible scenarios, which we're calling end of an era, dancing in the dark, digital first, and smarter but smaller with a question mark. And let me take you through those scenarios so you understand them. And as I'm talking you through them, what I want you to do is to think about, well, what is our business doing to prepare for this scenario? What would we do in this particular situation if we thought this might happen or if this was a viable possibility? So the first one is end of an era. This is, if you like, the worst case scenario where we don't get the pandemic under control. It continues to roll out. We could see maybe 30 million infections this year, potentially double that next year if it doesn't get under control put your own figure on the number of mortalities. But in this scenario, you probably wouldn't see a vaccine until 2022, and probably not seeing the bulk of the planet vaccinated fully until the end of 2023. In this scenario, while some countries are doing quite well in containing the pandemic, others are going in and out of different spikes. And we're already seeing this happen now. And the, the, the challenge is that even the countries that believe they've brought an end to the pandemic are at risk because this pandemic travels around the world in seat 43C of an aircraft. So even if we're tight within our own borders and we have it under control, as soon as we allow people in, we open ourselves up to risk. And we've just seen that happen now with New Zealand and then Iceland and now Melbourne, all having to deal with the fact that people have come in and brought in their, uh, the, the virus and, and effectively started new uh, infection patterns. And in Melbourne, we've seen they've had to lock down 300,000 people. Here in the UK, we've had to lock down a significant part of Leicester because there's a new peak. I've seen people raise their hands. Can I ask you to lower your hands? And the only way we'll take questions is by you putting your questions into the Q&A box. And if people upvote the questions, we'll respond to the ones that are most popular. So anyway, so this is in this scenario, very poor containment. You really don't see it eradicated till 2023. Uh, and obviously this has a big impact economically. What we see is countries trying to come out, but effectively each time they try to come out, there's a new wave of the pandemic in many countries that brings us back down again. Many businesses are already struggling. People are on furlough in many countries. Many of those jobs will go. As those businesses restart, if they don't, in this scenario, they don't find the level of business they were hoping for, so they make more redundancies or they close down. And many businesses are already starting to 
cut their expense budgets and their investment budgets, which has a knock on effect across their supply chain and will knock on into people's budgets for next year. So you can see how this creates that deep downturn. We're already seeing uh, estimates rising as to the, the level of negative GDP globally this year. The UK is predicted to have the worst fall in GDP of any developed economy. And we could see that carry on for at least two years and, and not coming out of this until around 2023. And certainly if you look at the aviation sector, most of the big aviation players now are assuming that it will take until at least 2023 to get to a new normal. And for them, that new normal will be about 80% of what they were achieving in 2019. So we're talk that's why we're talking about an end of an era. Old systems crumble, old structures crumble. Many of the things we took for granted start to erode. As industries, we really are in a very hesitant, very nervous state then, whether it's meetings, really moving to online predominantly small meetings may be happening in certain countries but international meetings in this scenario are very difficult because of the the border protection and quarantine on arrival the same is true for travel whereas domestic travel might develop and and people might be comfortable traveling within certain countries international becomes harder and harder because of the quarantine arrangements and the risks with that so this is why we talk about this as being the worst case scenario and this is the one that I think our industries tend to struggle with thinking about, but actually we probably need to put the most focus on. The second scenario is one where we have those same sort of patterns of countries going in and out of new peaks, but actually putting a much stronger focus on eradication, closing their borders and accepting a, a more severe economic hit in the short term in order to come out more robust in the long term. The key here, though, is that this is a global phenomenon. While any country is at risk, we're all at risk. And so in this scenario, the key is that the big nations, the G7, the G20, China, the major global institutions like the UN, World Health Organization, World Bank, IMF, EU, o, um, Organization of African Union, all of those major players come together to say, how do we support the poorest countries with the most fragile health ecosystems? And how do we help them build that infrastructure? How do we help them get in place effective mechanisms for testing, for tracking, for tracing, and for then rolling out vaccination? So in this scenario, it takes longer, but when we come out the other side, there's a much greater sense of security that we're not gonna go back into the pandemic because we've conquered it, and we're moving on. And by 2022, maybe we're pulling out and starting to see some green shoots of recovery. The third scenario is what many people see as happening now, where we continue with the pandemic, but we try and open up our economies as well. And there's a sort of hesitant rebound. In some places, meetings open up, travel is opened up. We start to see air bubbles emerge where people can travel between certain destinations. We start to see new models emerging of how we organize events, how we organize travel to ensure a super secure travel corridor. And I'll talk more about that. But still in this environment, digital dominates. So whether it's people doing their events digitally or in travel and tourism, people consuming more and more digital travel experiences, digital guides to destinations, digital storytelling of a destination, but not actually physically going there. And key here is that the government and banks are putting more support to help businesses grow but, and, and get back to something like normal, but businesses are hesitant to invest, to recruit more people. They try and sque squeeze more out of what they have. They put more effort into automation. So we don't necessarily see job growth too quickly in this scenario, but we do get a, a kind of hesitant rebound. And then the final scenario is if you like the most optimistic one where we get the pandemic under control as discussed earlier it's a global solution we get the vaccination rolled out by the end of 2022 and there's a real focus on vibrant economic rebounds where governments when they're giving bailouts to businesses are tying that to investment in innovation to investment in the creation of new jobs to investment in green and sustainable policies there's also a growing focus on investing in infrastructure development in particularly Green New Deal developments and a massive focus on training and reskilling people 
to take up the jobs in the new trillion dollar sectors that are coming through, mainly in areas of science and technology, whether it's vertical farming, synthetic biology, or autonomous vehicles. There's a whole range of those coming through. So this is the scenario where we see the most vibrant and sustainable rebound. And it really requires two things. That focus on getting a global solution to the pandemic, and also governments making a sustained commitment to bringing the economy back. Here you see a much faster return to physical travel, uh, people willing to take the risk more, particularly once the vaccine's out there, and also to the, the rebirth of live events. People willing to organize events, not waiting till the last minute to decide whether to do them or not, but really making that commitment to, to have live events and roll them out. So in this, situ in this scenario, or in, in this situation where we've got these four scenarios, as I say, the, the trick is not to prepare for the scenario we like best, but prepare for all of the scenarios, and in particular that worst case scenario, as you know, the, the warning signs become stronger and stronger. It's not our natural home territory as a group of industries. We tend not to want to think about that, but that's the one we have to do the most thinking of about in order to ensure a vibrant future for ourselves. And really what we've seen is individuals, organizations, and governments have really varied in their preparedness for this current crisis. Some have done an incredible job, whether it's companies that could move their staff to remote working within 24 hours, or countries that kicked in their response straight away. So you saw Taiwan and Singapore in particular take the lead. And in early January, they were already rolling out their response mechanisms because of the warnings coming out of China. And therefore, they've had very low infection levels and very low mortality rates. Others took a lot longer and were much less prepared. And so I think we're all learning now that being prepared for future shocks, being willing to think about a broader range of future shocks, and being capable of responding is now critical. And being capable means learning, and learning now moving to the top of the agenda. We're used in the meetings and events industry to facilitating learning, but now we need to be learning faster than our marketplaces. All of the sectors now need to be learning new skills, new ways of operating, trying new business models, being willing to experiment, knowing that there isn't a right answer. The challenge now is how fast are we learning? How fast are we trying new ideas and rolling them out to see what could work for us in this constantly changing environment? And we also know that even without this uh, pandemic, digital was already accelerating into our economy. It was already dominating many sectors and was going to take a lot of people out of their jobs, which would have had an impact on the industry anyway. On the other side, we know that it's also creating a lot of new sectors and would therefore create a lot of new jobs. But what we've seen in, in the, the, the pandemic period is a lot of businesses accelerate their investment in technology and accelerate the replacement of people with technology because they don't want to be reliant on humans should something like this happen again. And so that's a real challenge. And what we've seen is there are five big tech companies that are dominant in terms of the, the most valuable companies on the planet. Last year, we saw Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft all cross that magic threshold of being worth a trillion dollars. Now to put that in context, if you add together Volkswagen, Boeing, Bank of America, Disney, 21st Century Fox, Ford and Hilton, and then add in all these other companies, you still don't get one Apple. That is giving us a sense of how big and how powerful these companies have become and how their role in the economy is going to change, where they're going to move into being players in many sectors as well as providers and being a much bigger uh, influencer in the shape of sectors and trying to drive a greater digital infrastructure in sectors, which is going to have an impact. They'll be quite keen to see people using tech more for delivering events, delivering learning, delivering connection. So we have to think about how are we going to respond in a world where technology is more and more centric to the way things happen. So this sets up a set of personal challenges for us in terms of how do we navigate that uncertain future. And the first thing I think is around developing the capacity within ourselves to go looking for the gold, to go looking for the new ideas and the new opportunities, and not to be bound by that which we've always done in the past. So starting to think very broadly about what is it we can do to make sure our business stays viable if our core business is there, isn't there. So if we're a hotel and we can have no customers, what can we do with our facilities? 
if we're a meetings agency or a destination management company, but we don't have travelers in the same way as we used to, what can we do? And really starting to think broadly about what can we do in the changing landscape? And it's that willingness to look broadly, to scan the horizon for what's changing, to see where the money is, to see where the growth sectors are. So for example, right now, one of the fastest growing sectors is cardboard box manufacture because of the massive rise in demand for home delivery. And so people like Amazon and everyone else who's delivering to our homes have had a massive spike in demand for packaging equipment and packaging materials. And so it's, it's doing that analysis of the marketplace to understand in your country or in the regions you serve, which are the sectors that are doing best? Where is the opportunity? Where can we go digging for gold? Where can we go looking for interesting opportunities to either use our facilities differently or to, to generate demand for the services we offer? The second is not just looking to see where the opportunity is, but actually motivating ourselves to move on. I've had a lot of conversations with people where they see the idea, but they also tell me that that's not what we do, or there are people on our side, our organization, who just won't buy it. Even though logically they can see it, the emotion is that that's not what we do. So we're not gonna go there, or we're not gonna repurpose our facility for that, per for that use, because it's not how we're set up, and business might come back, and then what do we do? But I think now the challenge is to really find ways of motivating ourselves, surrounding ourselves with the people who really encourage us to say, that's a great idea, or why don't you go and learn more about it, or why don't you test it, or what is the next thing you're gonna to do to test that idea and see if it might work, rather than just having a conversation, because conversations in themselves don't move us on. It's only action and that willingness to move our butt. And the first thing we find is that once we start moving, we realize that the old ways of doing things don't necessarily work. So if I'm a convention center and it looks like there's gonna be more and more opportunities to set up testing facilities for people with COVID-19 or even mobile hospi uh, local hospital facilities for extension capacity, as we've seen some do, just doing what I've always done as a convention center isn't gonna be enough. I'm gonna to have to learn totally different ways of behaving. All of the familiar dance routines I knew to navigate me through different situations aren't going to work. I have to get on the dance floor and get embarrassed, learn new steps, learn new ways of doing things. And it's that willingness to try and that willingness to give more empowerment to the people inside our organizations who are willing to try rather than the people who just tell us why it can't happen or it shouldn't happen or it didn't happen that way in their day and it'll all be over soon, don't worry. You know, we really have to acknowledge what they're telling us, but empower the people who are willing to act and who are willing to try those new dance routines. And the next is about making sure that we're educating ourselves and really learning a lot of new skills quickly. And the great thing is that there's a lot of free resources out there for us to learn all about the new world. Uh, you can go to the big universities like Harvard, where they're providing free content now. You can learn almost anything from them for free online. Uh, you only pay for the certification, which means that there's no excuse now for us not to be learning. And I'm seeing more and more client organizations where what they've done with their senior team is have them or encourage them to constantly be learning something new, to always be on a course of some sort, and to be investing at least half an hour a day in some form of learning. So they're moving themselves forward, understanding a changing world and getting new tactics and ideas for how we navigate through both the short term and the longer term. The other thing that's really interesting now is these new platforms are moving us beyond just the traditional models of education to saying, how do I get to the people who really know? So if I think that actually I wanna set up events for people in the synthetic biology marketplace because there's a huge amount of venture capital money going into synthetic biology, that's a sector that's growing, they're gonna be having events, we can support them. How do we go after them? How do we learn about their sector? Uh, we are now seeing platforms like Quirio and World Mastery that are giving us access directly to the experts in a field, not just academics, but to the individuals who we might want a few hours with to really pick their brains and understand what we need to know and have them tell us what they think we need to understand in order to work effectively with the sector and deliver effectively to the solutions they need. And similarly, World Mastery is more about 
uh, personal uh, interests. So whether it's yoga or basket weaving, they connect people to the experts in those fields to, to create courses. Now, what we think is going to happen is there's going to be a growth in demand for people doing those kinds of personal uh, travel experiences where they're learning something and they're going into a cocooned experience to learn from masters in a particular location where it's a very secure travel experience. But we need to understand from those masters how you deliver a good experience, what it is they need in facility terms, how you market these things so we can partner with them to market these changing travel and tourism experiences. And the final thing is about working out where we want to play. Just because we're a destination management company or an event agency or a travel agency or a, a hotel that's just been used to doing leisure travel, and that's what all our competitors do as far as we understand, we now need to be really clear on what space we might want to play in given the opportunities that are emerging. So it's not just about understanding what the rest of the sector are doing, it's about what, are, what is our organization wanting to do. And also for us as individuals, really being clear on what we want going forward. How do we maximize our personal opportunities in the face of all this uncertainty? Because I'm guessing for an awful lot of the people on this webinar, there's a level of uncertainty about what our job is. So this finding our space is all the things I talked about and finding our space apply just to, as much to us as individuals as to our organizations. And the final piece is about how do we use our voice? How do we get the message out there that we have something new to offer or this is now what we're capable of doing? So if we're, let's say a hotel, that's now willing to offer our facilities to schools as expansion space so they can do socially distanced teaching. Well, how do we do that? Through our staff, through our community, through our newsletters, through our social media. What are all the different channels that we can use to get the message out there in a very crowded marketplace to explain what we're now offering and what it is we can make possible and really being very clever about how we use both physical word of mouth and digital word of mouth to make people aware of what we're doing and what we're making available as solutions and trying to get to the key influencers in those sectors so they talk about what we're doing. So if that's the, the scenarios and some of the things we need to do to get ourselves in the right frame of mind to go after the future, then what can we do to actually unlock opportunity as organizations? Well, the first I think is this deep industry collaboration. One of the things that I hear from clients in the corporate world is they're reluctant to have their people travel and to go to events because they're, they're worried about an inconsistent experience between the travel company taking their staff to the airport, the airport, the airline, the travel at the other end, the hotel, the venue that the event might be at, the travel between hotel and venue. They're worried about an inconsistency around trust, testing and standards and personal protection and all of those things. So I think we need to be collaborating not only within our industry, but across all the sectors that come to form travel experiences, uh, that come to form event experiences. And also really using the players we have who can, who can coordinate that. So in the case of a lot of locations, we have convention and visitor bureaus who can, be, you know, who can do this at the location level, try to get consistency across all the players in terms of what kind of experience will a customer have when they arrive at a hotel or when they arrive at an airport or as they move through the airport to the plane so that we can start to give that real consistency of experience and develop a really strong word of mouth around our destination being secure. The other thing is about deepening the dialogue we have with our customers, whether business or individual, really going back and talking to the people who've used us before, the people we've served in the past, the people who might have booked with us and then canceled because of the pandemic, to understand how do they see the future? What are their concerns? What are their emerging needs? What are their expectations? And are we aligning our thinking to the way they're talking? Because at the moment, I see quite a strong misalignment, particularly in the corporate space, between what event agencies and bureaus and, and uh, convention centers are saying and what I hear from the corporate world about how quickly events will come back. Now, I understand that on the supply side, we naturally want to be optimistic and very hopeful. 
but when I see people saying that we will be back to normal and back to 2019 levels of business by the start of next year, I either want to, you know, smoke whatever it is those people are smoking so I can be that happy or have them take some sort of wake up call because that's not going to happen. Their customers simply aren't moving that way. The second thing is this notion of creating really secure end to end solutions. So we're seeing this now in travel. So for example, Ras Al Khaimah, which is one of the Emirates in the United Arab Emirates, now has Russian tourists coming in. They're organized by uh, travel companies and destination management companies in Russia. They test all the, the travelers before they come. They come on a, a chartered plane. They come to Ras Al Khaimah Airport, which is quite a small airport, but they go through dedicated channels in the airport. Everyone is tested before they travel. The people driving them from the airport to the hotel are tested on a regular basis. The staff in the hotel are tested. The, the, the travelers agree not to leave the hotel. It's a cocooned experience. So they effectively quarantine the whole time they're there, but then they travel back the same way. So they're in a cocooned experience. There's a very secure end-to-end -end solution there. And the same is gonna have to happen for meetings where you know, we're taking people from a particular destination in the same way, and we're just ensuring their security throughout the whole journey. Very different to how we might've done this in the past, but we have to think about how do we rebuild business in a world which is so turbulent, where there is so much risk? What can we do to protect and cocoon our guests, our event visitors, our travelers, in a way that makes them feel comfortable about traveling? The next is about really thinking differently about how do we deliver the experience we do, we do and who are the right partners. So we're, having to see, we're seeing a lot of event agencies used to putting on physical events, now having to master the tools of digital event delivery and having to learn very different ways of delivering experiences, mastering new tools like collaborative dialogue tools, where you can have a lot of people sharing their views so that you can understand different perspectives in the way that you might in a physical workshop, but you tend not to do in a webinar. But having to learn these new tools so they can take to their clients a range of options as how you do, you do delivery. Partnering with new technology providers. Destinations now partnering with technology providers to create virtual tours, virtual walking tours of their destination, uh, virtual reality tours, which they can maybe monetize uh, going forward so they can still generate revenue. But also at the local level, starting to partner with the attractions in a destination so that if the tourists in our hotel or the people attending our event want to go and visit the Parthenon or um, St. Mark's Square, we're arranging a dedicated time where only our, our guests can go it's completely secure. Again, there's no one else there. The staff at the destination, at the attraction are themselves tested. So we have, again, this super sealed, hermetically sealed experience to deepen the experience of the traveler, to increase their trust and their willingness to go and see whatever it is that's there so that we can create, still create a rich travel experience or a rich meetings experience, but not have them just locked into the hotel in between the events that they're doing. The next is recognizing that we're having to move to this environment where we're contactless, we're paperless, and, and effectively human light in many experiences. So now you're seeing hotels moving to the stage where the guests are checking themselves in, they're taking their own luggage, they don't have a restaurant anymore, the food arrives at your door. That has an impact on the culture of the organization, that has an impact on the guest experience both positive and negative. And we're seeing how quickly this can be delivered. This is Bangalore Airport that you see on the screen. The aviation sector was thinking that it would be two years before you could have a truly contactless passenger journey from curb to cabin. Bangalore Airport in January saw what was going on in China and basically said that they were gonna create a contactless experience in 60 days. And now you have exactly that from curb to, to aircraft cabin, you don't talk to a human, you don't touch any surface, you don't hand over paper, there's no human interaction. It's entirely contactless to increase the security. Obviously there's a cultural issue, there's a, there's a staffing implication there, but it's really thinking about how do we deliver that? And if they've got that in the airport, 
then how do we make sure that they're having a similar kind of a experience in our hotel or our convention center or any visitor attraction they're going to? The next is, you know, particularly for the events industry, is thinking about, well, where might the opportunities be to create new high value meetings? And despite the downturn, some sectors are growing and some are, are securing a lot of investment because they're potentially the next trillion dollar sectors. Uh, there are many here on the screen. And the, the trick is about, again, doing that research to identify which are the sectors that are growing, that are still creating meetings, that want to meet physically because there are things they want to do in terms of deal making, in terms of demonstrating their product and service solutions that they can't do effectively online. I'm really targeting on those growth sectors that have money that are willing to create something physical. I think we have to be very smart now in terms of where we focus. One of the big issues that I keep hearing about is that the insurance industry is saying to a lot of companies, no, we, we won't insure your people if you travel to a particular destination and then they, they get infected. Uh, and lawyers, um, and, and also the insurance company saying, and you're not covered if your employee brings a suit against you for getting infected if, when they're on company business. And individuals finding that their personal insurance policies for travel don't cover them for this if they're going to a location that is known to still have high infection rates. So really understanding what the insurance industry is saying and, and trying to work out who are the people that can get insured or even working with the insurance industry to create new policies, maybe at a destination level so that we can give people the confidence to come back to our particular destination. And that all feeds into that conversation with clients to truly understand what is their perspective around business travel policies? What are they saying about when their staff might travel again? What are the hurdles that they believe we need to cross before they're willing to let staff travel just on normal business or to go on conventions or any other kind of business travel? So really important understanding both from an individual leisure traveler perspective, but also from a corporate traveler and an event traveler perspective, what the business travel policies are now and what the insurance industry's perspective is on this. The next is about just acknowledging that we may not be as full with normal leisure travelers, business travelers or events in, in, for some time to come. What can we do to repurpose our facilities? I already mentioned the idea of providing overflow facilities to schools and universities and colleges where they need to physically distance the students. They can't do it all in their own buildings. So why not in the same way as some convention centers have provided medical facilities, why not provide education facilities? A lot of retailers are closing their retail outlets because they just can't afford them anymore, but they still want to sell. They're going to move to pop-up markets of some sort. I think for a lot of venues, whether it's hotels or convention centers, they have sufficiently sized meeting spaces where they can create pop-up retail markets, either in the evenings, weekends, or whatever, where they design the one-way flow through, they've designed the physical distancing solutions, they create the stands, they provide the cleaning, and enable people to just come in and do their retail, so that you can generate revenue for the facility, but also generate economic activity for those retailers. Companies looking for temporary warehousing solutions that they, because they need to physically distance their staff in the warehouse people needing to use space to think about how do we redesign our offices, uh, renting our meeting space out just to let people experiment. I think there's a whole range of ideas out there. If we're willing to look and say, how else could we use our facilities whilst we're uncertain about the return of leisure travelers, business travelers uh, and meetings and events. The next is to start to think about how do we, uh, generate new revenues in a world where maybe more is moving online in the short term. So for a lot of the people in the event space, starting to think about what can we do to create those kind of micro credentialing solutions, micro learning solutions that people might be willing to pay for. One of the things that we expect to happen is that with the abundance of free events and people's fatigue with attending webinars, we're going to see less general webinars and conferences that people are willing to pay for, but a greater willingness to pay for very targeted learning experiences. 
So how do we position ourselves to take advantage of that? Also, when we come back, when things start to recover, the question is, will we come back with the same volume of events? And already it's very clear that with the, the, the meetings and travel industry being very heavily affected, a lot of redundancies already, it's unlikely in the near term that we're going to see as many people coming back to all of the industry events we see at the local, at the national, at the regional and the global level. So there's going to have to be some sort of rationalization there. And those companies or associations or event organizers in that space are going to have to think very creatively about what do we do when there's so many events in our sector and there's not as many people around to attend, there's not as much money for them to attend. What are we going to do? Are we going to merge events? Are we going to have different types of events? Are we going to focus more on the delivery of different kinds of learning experiences throughout the year, which we can monetize. I think we're at that point now where we need to use the crisis as an opportunity to really think about that worst case scenario in particular that said, you know, what if we couldn't do a physical event for two years? How would we make money? And the, the ideas we generate could then be viable in the long term, whatever else we, happens and whenever the live events experience returns. And the next is, to make sure we as an organization and we as an individual are continuously learning, are willing to experiment, are willing to try new things and really push the boundaries of experimentation because we don't know what's going to work. We don't know where the opportunities are. We don't know how long it will be before we get back to, you know, what you might call normal in terms of events or leisure travel. Some destinations are opening up, yes, but then they're closing down again. Some are allowing meetings of up to 30 or 50 or even 500, I believe, in Alaska. But then there are travel bans and border restrictions. So we know that we're not at normal yet, and it could be some time before we get there. So what are we doing to learn new ideas, new models of delivery, new opportunities, experiment with new things that we could be doing either with our, our capabilities as an organization or our physical resources in order to ensure a viable future for ourselves. And the final one is sustainability. We've been through uh, an interesting period where the environment has been one of the biggest winners. We've seen cleaner water, we've seen wildlife emerging that has been hidden from us for some time, improvements in air quality, improvements in emissions. And there's a huge conversation now across the planet about how do we sustain those goals? And a huge part of the corporate agenda going forward is going to be making sure that whatever strategy any business has, they're running it through the sustainable development goals to make sure that they're doing whatever they do in a way that enhances the sustainability of the planet. So for all of us, we can't put this to one side. We have to make sure that we're improving our sustainability through whatever strategies we pursue in the next months and years so that when live events come back, when live travel comes back, when live hospitality comes back to a much higher level, we can demonstrate that we've enhanced our sustainability and that we can meet the requirements of our travelers or the corporates that might want to use us. So that's a fairly rapid travel uh, journey through the scenarios, some of the personal challenges and some strategies to help us navigate this environment. And that really takes us back to the three critical challenges. Uh, as I say, I want to reiterate those. We have to prepare for a range of different possible scenarios. We can't just hope for the best, we have to prepare for the worst. We also have to make sure that we're building our capacity to really anticipate what might be happening, understand changing customer needs, and responding to the kinds of shifts that are happening to make sure that we're learning new ideas, we're finding new opportunities, and becoming more and more flexible and adaptable and willing to experiment with how we can generate new opportunities, generate the kind of revenues we need to keep us viable and make sure that we've got a lifeline to the future. So I talked earlier about learning to dance. I think really the, the bottom line for me now is that in every sector, what we did before just may not be enough for us going forward. And I think the hospitality sector, the event sector, the aviation sector are amongst the hardest hit. And our old routines just aren't gonna cut it in a world where we don't have the same level of business we don't have the same expectation of business returning to normal as, as other sectors. We have to learn new ways of operating, new ways of delivering what we deliver, 
creating new services and solutions and generating new revenue streams for ourselves to ensure our sustainability and our viability into the long term. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that's given you some food for thought. Uh, for those that have stayed all the way through or are watching the video afterwards, a little gift for you as well. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch with our general thinking about the emerging future, uh, we have a newsletter that comes out roughly once a week. It's normally $149 for the year. But for showing us your support to join this seminar, we're happy to give it to you for free if you go to our website and just uh, enter that coupon code at checkout. Just take a picture of the screen uh, and you're there. Um, so I am going to now put up a, a polling question just to get you sharing your thoughts on this. So uh, we've got the poll up on the screen right now. Two questions. The first is, which scenario do you think is most likely in your country of the four I presented? And which are you doing the most preparation for? So it should be up on your screen now. And just answer one in each of those uh, columns, uh, each of those questions. Uh, again, I see someone's raised your hand. If you've got a question, please put your question into the Q&A box and we'll take those in a second. In fact, whilst uh, we're doing this, I'll just have a look at the questions. Okay, so we've got a nice spread of questions. I'll, I'll come to those in a second and um, just let you answer these very quickly. In fact, while you're answering the question, while, while you're answering the poll question, let me take the first question from Stephanie Chung. Uh, what is the danger of dim digital dominated by the big five specifically as it relates to the travel industry? How do we stay in control of the narrative? Um, well, I think that's interesting. Uh, from a passenger and a traveler point of view, the control of the narrative is about who offers me the best experience. And what we're seeing is travelers and individuals becoming much more familiar with the technology. During this period, they've become much more used to using the technology. And so it's whoever gives them the best experience of both the physical travel experience, but also the technology to manage it. The, the tech companies realize that now, and we're seeing a continuous flow of companies pushing uh, not only to sell their technologies to the industry, but also to joint venture now and saying, we'll bring our technology in because they think that they can do a lot of what the industry does better. I've been approached literally almost every week by a tech vendor saying, can you get involved with us? Because we want to get, we want to invest in an industry, which company should we invest in? Because that will help us get our technology to market faster. And we think we can do it better than this airline, this hotel, this event company, this convention center or whatever. So they see the opportunity and therefore for the industry, the challenge is to raise our digital literacy. So we really understand the technology and what it can do and then make sure we're making really good choices about which technologies to use to enhance the traveler experience. And then partnering potentially with smaller tech companies with newer and cleverer technology who want to get access to the market so that we can use those technologies to differentiate ourselves, but recognizing that that differentiation is very short lived. And what we might do that works for six months might get overtaken in six months time. So it's really upping our game in technology that helps us stay in the game and helps us stay ahead. And ultimately, it's always going to be about the end experience we create. But the more we can use technology to enhance that experience in terms of booking, in terms of managing the dialogue with the customers, the more likelihood we have of competing effectively. OK, let's have a look at the poll responses now. Uh, I think we stopped, most people have stopped voting, so I'm going to show you what the results are. So, interesting. Um, which scenario do you think is the most likely in your country? Uh, the digital dominates, poorly contained pandemic and a hesitant economic rebound. And then we're pretty equal across the, the other three. Just over half of you are saying you think that's the one. And I, you know, I think that's what's being borne out by current experience. And which scenario are you doing the most preparation for? Again, slightly less, but still uh, the single biggest group are voting on digital um, uh, dominates. What I would be saying is give at least some time to thinking about that scenario of an end of an era. 
what happens if we have a prolonged pandemic and a deep and prolonged economic downturn? What are your strategies? You won't lose anything by it because the ideas that you come up with could be viable in any other set scenario. Uh, and I'm going to give you a second question, more for fun than anything. Um, and this question is about how are you feeling personally? How are you feeling about your personal future over the next three years? Uh, and while you're doing that, I'm going to take another one of the questions. Uh, so that one's done. Uh, we've got a question from Salira Green. How about creating, combining virtual reality experiences with online meeting experiences would involve new partnerships, perhaps between gaming industry, virtual reality providers and online event companies, liaising with corporations wanting to achieve specific goals and creating exciting learning strategies and experiences. Yes, I think that's a viable option, but I don't think that replaces mass travel. I don't think that replaces the mass event experience. It becomes another part of the experience where you have these combined physical virtual experiences, but I don't think that becomes the, the mass solution not least because of the affordability of the technology, uh, people's willing, reluctance to necessarily do everything via technology. We spend a lot of our time behind a screen. A lot of people want to go and experience it for real. And I think that's one of our plus points is that people want to be in the destination. They don't want to be consuming the destination virtually all the time. Um, uh, I don't even understand this question. Uh, from Mihai uh, Dinu. What is, in your, in your opinion, the best combo between the four scenarios you presented? Yeah, this isn't like going to a local restaurant where you have a buffet uh, and you pay a price and then you can take what you want from, from all the different dishes. This is about how things might play out. So you, yeah, inevitably, there'll be elements of all those scenarios and what comes out. The best combo, obviously, is where we get rid of the pandemic quickly and we get a more vibrant economic rebound where confidence returns, people are willing to spend, governments invest wisely, banks are willing to lend, we, we invest in retraining and reskilling, we make sure that businesses are using their bailout packages to invest in innovation, to invest in greening their business, to invest in reskilling their staff, and we're putting a lot of focus on a long-term sustainability. But that isn't something that you know, we can simply say, well, that's what we want. Yeah. It, it all depends on how things play out. And right now, obviously, the biggest problem we have is a really poor coordination around global eradication of the pandemic. And we're, you know, some of the most badly affected countries are some of the biggest countries and some of the economically strongest countries. So we look, you know, the US, the UK, Brazil, Mexico, India, Pakistan, huge populations. Uh, with rising infection levels in some parts of the country, in many parts of the country, in, in some cases, those are the ones that are a concern. And they're very focused on their own needs rather than how do we eradicate this globally. So until we get some global alignment, as we did with dealing with the global financial crisis, we have a problem. And until we address that problem, uh, this isn't going anywhere. Uh, next question from anonymous attendee. Right. Do you have any insights as to what trade shows might look like in the future? I think you've seen some examples of what you can do with virtual trade shows and they're kind of fun, but they're, you know, there's that sense that they're not quite right. People creating things in things in, you know, virtual environments like Second Life and things, uh, bringing the technology of gaming to the trade show experience. But I still think we what people will want the virtual, uh, the, the physical experience. I think the challenge will be how we make those physical trade show experiences much more interesting, much more entertaining, much more engaging. So if someone who might have gone to four trade shows a year is now saying, well, no, I can't afford that. My, my employers won't let me. I don't have the same volume of business to go to four trade shows. I might go to one or two. How do we stand out? How do we create really interesting and engaging learning experiences with the trade show stands, what do we do to really attract people in, to give them great information, to have them give us information in advance about their needs so we've got a much more tailored conversation. I think there's a whole range of things, maybe more and more of the kind of speed dating before uh, we have the trade show itself, where you have a short conversation before the trade show with, with the vendors to identify the trade show vendors that you really want to talk to and then you book time slots with them 
I think there'll be a lot of experimentation to create the next generation of, uh, of trade show vibrancy. Okay, let's, um, let's take this next polling uh, question. Uh, interesting. So the question was, how are you feeling about your personal future in the next three years? And the winner is, I'm still standing, followed by things can only get better. You see, this is a very positive industry. We, we tend to look on the positive side. There are a handful of us who think we're on the highway to hell, a couple of us uh, believing that mama told me not to come, and then uh, uh, a few who are just waiting for it all to be over. For those of you who don't know and wondering where the, the titles come from, they're all song titles. So um, just in case you're wondering, um, I don't normally talk in that language. But anyway, uh, so that, that was a bit of fun. Let's take a few more questions. We, we're coming up to uh, seven o'clock here in the UK, the end of this. I'm going to carry on taking questions while people are asking, but if you want to leave, by all means do. Uh, the information is up on the screen. Um, we will be putting the report up probably on Monday and uh, we'll email everyone who's been at this event on Monday with the video, also everyone who registered and we'll give them the link to download the report. So thank you for coming if you, if you need to leave. Uh, I'm gonna carry on answering a few questions until it's just me and the last person standing no, there. 7.15, I'll stop for sure. Uh, uh, Cornelius Holthoff asks, in tourism, given that the risk of falling seriously ill from the virus is not much bigger than that from a severe influenza. Uh, a, I think you're wrong on that if you look at the data, but should we not expect governments to be much more concerned about infections than the traveling tourists themselves? Might they not be very keen to leave the cocoon you were describing for a fuller experience of the visited country? Yes, they might be, but this is a government issue and this is also a security and an, an insurance issue and I think particularly when you're, you're trying to book groups in and you're trying to fill properties, then a safer way might be to say, look, we're managing the whole experience from you, for you. I do have a look at the data that's out there uh, as to the number of people who've been infected and who've died from COVID-19 this year versus influenza. I, I, I think that, you know, we, we sometimes get confused about this, but do look at reliable sources of data. There are very big differences in the numbers. Uh, and I think governments are very concerned because the last thing a government wants is people coming to their destination, catching COVID-19, and then effectively having to shut their destination down. So the more they can contain it, the happier they'll be. And effectively, a lot of countries are already having these 14-day quarantine on arrival arrangements. So this is turning 14 days quarantine on arrival into a holiday on arrival or effectively doing the quarantine on arrival in a particular location and then going back again and having special arrangements for that government to say, and therefore you don't need us to quarantine for 14 days because we're never going to come in contact with anyone other than people who are tested and who are secure. So this is about how do we navigate our way through the short term. It's not ideal. This is not how I would be selling holidays in the long term, but it's how I would try and navigate my way through. And it's an experiment we have to be trying. Uh, Norm Rose asks, given the power of the big tech companies, why haven't these companies aggressively promoted virtual reality via platforms such as Oculus and HoloLens to enable not only VR participation, but also virtual networking? Now, there's, there's lots of different reasons for that. One is as consumers, we don't really like wrapping big lumps of technology around our heads. Uh, so you saw that with 3D glasses. You saw that with the first versions of virtual reality glasses and uh, augmented reality glasses. You remember? Uh, Google Glass, there's a consumer take-up issue here. And I, I think people don't necessarily want to use these things on a, a long-term basis for a travel experience or traveling around a destination. I might put the headset on for 10 minutes. If, for example, I'm in uh, the Colosseum in Rome and I want to visualize what it would have looked like full of people and with activity going on, that would be perfect. But I don't want to travel the whole way around Rome the whole time with a large lump of steel and metal strapped to my head. And I think a lot of people will, see, will feel the same way. So I think, and, and the tech companies can't give this stuff away. It is still costly to produce and roll out. And so I don't think they're going to be giving it away anytime soon. It may come a point where in two or three years time, it is embedded in the tech we're buying, like our mobile phones but I don't think that's, that's gonna happen anytime soon. 
Uh, okay, next question. Roy, great talk. How do you see the future of cruising industry? Uh, anonymous attendee. Um, I wonder if that's one of my friends at Carnival. Um, the unfortunate thing with the cruise industry is that, uh, you know, they were some of the earliest hotspots that were highlighted by a lot of people. You know, there were infections on, on cruise liners. I think there'll be a nervousness around cruise travel. And I think the challenge for the cruise industry is really demonstrating just how secure the cruising experience can be, which would mean things like not only testing on arrival at the port, but testing regularly during the cruise, having people airlifted off the cruise ship if, if they do get infected, uh, rather than quarantined on board because of the risks of it, you know, getting into the air circulation. Um, the kind of levels of protection on board, huge issues around things like dining. I mean, there's, there's one of the big attractions of cruising is the different dining experiences, the different leisure experiences, the, the onboard swimming pool, the onboard cinema and all the other things. If there are big restrictions on what you can do there, I think that changes the experience. And that's why I think you have to really go an extra mile with continuous testing, making sure that all your staff are regularly tested. If you can get antibody tests, that's even better. But really pushing hard to demonstrate that and then using video to communicate your experience. So, so the Bangalore airport video that shows that contactless journey is a really powerful selling tool when people are deciding which airport they might want to use. And for airlines that are shedding routes and, and deciding which routes to close, that encourages the airlines to think, well, actually, Bangalore is probably a good destination to go to because our passengers will sit, feel safer traveling to there or traveling from there. Uh, Trevor Ward says, the possibility is that there is a lot of m and activity. Oh, you've gone, Trevor. Someone's just overtaking you. I don't know why. Um, uh, in the hotel sector and in the airline industry, too. So that there will be big, maybe massive boys and, also, and the also rans at the smaller end of the scale. Can this ever be good for the consumer? It depends on who you're asking, doesn't it? Uh, at one level, I think that the benefit of small is that you can be incredibly flexible. You can be incredibly responsive. If you've only got one or two hotels or a small portfolio, you can roll things out quicker. You can experiment faster. You can share learning faster. You can train faster. Uh, the same, I think, with airlines, Small airlines can maybe adapt quicker, change routes quicker, change what they're shipping from people to cargo quicker, change, you know, move to where the demand is, move from uh, scheduled routes to doing these hermetically sealed, effectively, um, uh, you know, I can't remember the name of the term, but, you know, only working charter uh, flights with partners where you're saying we're only taking your passengers and we've got these highly controlled measures all the way through. Um, so I think there's still a, a place for them. M&A in the airline industry hasn't always been successful. M&A in the hotel industry could be if it gives you big cost savings at the center because you're managing portfolios of brands. I don't know what value any of the M&A will create for the end customer. That would be my concern. Is this just financial restructuring or is this giving real value to the end customer? So, I, you know, inevitably it will happen, but then they'll break up. Then these companies will see they're too big. Their shareholders might get unhappy that they're not delivering the right returns and they'll ask them to break them up. So nothing is forever. Uh, and so even if we do see a lot of M&A, I think that it won't last for that long. And actually the need for but people wanting more and more customized and unique experiences might put pressure on the brands to release some of the boutique brands and the, the more individual style brands to do their own thing and pursue their own path. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, people are being very good and staying. There's a huge number of you still in the room. Uh, Carl Weldon asks, how do you see the development of online virtual platforms for larger events? A, especially at reasonable cost, given the current availability uh, is primarily large and expensive, and B, the development of the technology itself, e.g. virtual translation. Yeah, I and mean, it's all happening. and It's being accelerated. We're seeing some incredible stuff happening 
in the AI field with real-time natural language translation that will totally change our online experiences. And I do think you will see more and more people creating online events that are large events that sustain, but there's still issues. So if we have a large virtual, uh, a large citywide event or a, a large 5,000, 10,000 person event, everyone comes to that destination. The time schedule is the same. Everyone can consume things at the time schedule that we have and then meet who they need to. When you're doing it online, you have to be really conscious of time zones. And no one really wants to sit in front of a screen for hours on end. So you have to start to find clever design solutions to navigate through all that. And so there's always going to be a space for those physical things. But by the time we get back to having those large virtual events, and I can't see that happening before the middle of next year, you know, the big thousand plus, five thousand plus events, I just, I don't hear anyone telling me how they're going to enable that before you know the middle of next year so by then a lot will have happened a lot of people will have changed their event structures will have moved and experimented uh, a lot of technology innovation will happen in this space so you might see more and more people saying yeah we like the new model where it's an hour a day for six hours uh, you know over the course of six days and we get to meet the people we want to meet at the times we want to meet and it's at different time zones during the day or whatever i, I think we'll see a lot of innovation there a lot of people will like it. Where it doesn't seem to be working right now is the senior level events. We're hearing a lot of complaints that people at the top level, boards, executive leadership teams, the gathering of the top 100, 200, whatever, or the, the, you know, the exclusive C-level events, they really like rubbing shoulders with their competitors, with their colleagues, and they're missing that. And, and so I think that it won't be necessarily the massive events that there's real pressure to recreate quickly, but it will be that level of exclusive event. And you might do that. I mean, we're still talking to one event that we're supposed to have been doing in Bangkok earlier this year, where it's the heads of all of the largest financial institutions in Asia. They're all gonna fly in by private jet. So the, the, the conversation is, well, let's just choose a time when we'll still do that. And let's just choose a venue that can guarantee everyone's health and safety when we come. So those things might still happen. I think the massive ones are going to be much harder. And countries, I think, are going to be nervous about opening up to that kind of thing, not only because of the risk of what people might pick up when they come, but also what they might bring with them. So I think that the, the online virtual development is going to accelerate and there will be take up for it. Stephanie Chung again. You mentioned joint ventures with technology companies and being asked to give feedback about what to invest in. What have you, innovation have you seen from those joint ventures what are some untapped opportunities interesting uh right now there seems to be a, a lot of interest in the idea of creating super apps uh so covering everything that an airline does both internally but also every kind of experience you might want to have with an airline or multiple airlines uh, and the same for the kind of hotel sector so people saying rather than having one app for every hotel or for every travel site let me give you a super app there's a lot of interest in that Secondly, the kind of efficient management of our organizations. A lot of interest in how do we use the data in smarter and smarter ways to really understand what's going on. Can we put sensors on everything so we can work out of all the furniture of every item in a hotel room, what actually gets touched even or gets used? And if we discover that some of that beautiful furniture never gets touched, some of the paintings never get looked at, you know, whatever, can we start to be smarter in the management of what we have and make some of those things on demand rather than just there just in case uh i can't give away anymore because some of the most interesting ones are commercial in confidence uh sean worker um what industries companies orgs have inspired your team's thinking that have responded versus reacted and may have first move a status uh that's interesting i mean i think uh, I've been really impressed by some of the restaurants who have learned very quickly and have realized very quickly that they can't come back until there's a vaccine. That whilst there's physical distancing, they can never make any profit because they can't get the number of covers into a restaurant. And they're giving up their restaurant properties and moving to so-called ghost kitchens where they're in a, a, a cheaper location, maybe in a warehouse or in a factory unit, 
where they're maybe sharing with other restaurants, other chefs, they're cooking to demand for, you know, takeaways, for home delivery, for event catering. They've cut a huge amount of their overheads. Uh, they can be much more experimental with their menu and um, they can learn much faster from the data. So that's a, a, one really good example of companies you know, that have innovated. I think we've seen a lot of really interesting collaborations between you know, Formula One racing teams and aircraft manufacturers to create um, respirators and other kinds of equipment. We've seen high-end clothing manufacturers move from doing custom clothing to doing protective equipment. People who've been willing to respond, who've been entrepreneurial and said, we have capability, how do we repurpose that for what we, you know, what the market needs? And, and everywhere you look, you see really incredible examples. Uh, and one brilliant one I heard, uh, I was talking to a journalist last week, and um, she was telling me about her son, who's 17, uh, couldn't get a job, but had a real interest in designer watches. So he decided to set up a website uh, talking about designer watches and just to invest a little bit to kind of set the site up and then realized that the big revenue opportunity was that there were high-end watch companies, uh, retailers all around the world who had no customers at the moment because no one could go into their stores. So they reached out to the players in Beverly Hills first and got them advertising on this 17 year old site. Uh, and so suddenly there's someone who spotted an opportunity and created a great new, new you know, market. I think that's brilliant. And, I, you know, there's lots of examples of that knocking around. Uh, from Jamil Janjua, my good friend from Pakistan and Dubai. Is there not a possibility that the coronavirus could be eradicated from the medicine that is available, but not known for its efficacy? Grandma's type of vice at this time. And suddenly we find the world can go back to how it was before the pandemic. Well, yeah, but, you know, we've got to find it. So it could well be out there. There are literally hundreds of thousands of medications hundreds of thousands of herbal remedies and natural remedies and all sorts of things. Maybe some combination of those could do it, but we haven't found the perfect answer. You know, remdesivir might be a, a, a something that could help, but until we have it, uh, it's just conjecture. So it doesn't really move us forward saying there might be something. We have to be doing the research. We have to be gathering the evidence and, and proving it clinically to be able to then scale it up and roll it out globally as something that could work everywhere. It isn't good enough to have something that just works for rich countries because this, this virus travels around the, planet, the world on aircraft. If somewhere in Somalia or Yemen or Afghanistan or Pakistan or India or Brazil or London has it, it can travel anywhere around the world. So we have to eradicate it everywhere in order to make sure it's under control. Uh, question from Michael Anderson. Great. Thank, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, Anonymous attendee, how to make our teams less worried and scared and trying experimenting with new ideas for start, staying in the game? Well, what are they more scared of? Uh, this is where you have to be really honest, uh, appeal to their inner child. What are they more scared of? Unknown and using hope as a strategy where hope doesn't seem to be playing out at the moment or going out there and experimenting. You've got nothing to lose. And that's what I would be saying is going out, looking for ideas, looking for where is their activity in the marketplace and where could we play? So again, if we're an event agency, who else could we offer those kind of organization skills to? What are we doing to learn the new tools for event delivery? Uh, you know, what are we doing to create new added value services for our customers? Who are the people that we're developing as our list of contacts? Because every event I speak at and contact, there's normally someone there, you know, they want someone from the government health agency, someone there from, you know, policing, someone there talking to them about customs arrangements. They, they're always wanting access to experts who can tell them stuff. So, you know, what can we do to build up our knowledge that can then be of value? Uh, similarly, if I'm a destination, you know, uh, I'm a convention bureau, then maybe the, one of the new services I start to offer is becoming the, the gatherer of that information of expertise. Who can I, you know, who needs this expertise in order to run their events? Maybe we become a provider and we charge a small amount of it for it. You know, we have to start thinking about clever things we can do and we have to encourage our people to, to be willing to experiment and try. And those that aren't, you know, the, the, the question for them is, well, what, what, what would you have us do? Just sit and wait and hope because that's not going to work. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to take two more questions and then I think it's time to release you all. Uh, from Xian Yong, uh, do you anticipate that the pandemic will signal the death of investment in new hard assets in the sector for quite a few years with a hard shift to property assets in other sectors, e.g. logistics data centers, or will the need for physical meetings, in your view, ultimately override this so that there is good, M good m as for the better place place? I think in certain locations, th there's always going to be M&A. Right now, I wouldn't be imagining a lot of that. I think there'll be a lot of repurposing of facilities. So in some places, it's inevitable that their convention center is never going to come back. The demand just won't be there, or that their hotel or you know, their restaurant or whatever is never going to come back. I, I think it's inevitable that some of these facilities just won't come back, and uh, others might have to find other uses for part of their facility. Others might have to put expansion plans on hold for a while. Until we have real confidence that you know, the market is coming back and that we're over the pandemic, because whilst we're not over the pandemic, there's always risks. So, and, and I think, you know, from an M&A perspective, the month, there'll be a lot more money than there necessarily are opportunities in the short term. But I think a lot of that money is going to start moving towards Green New Deal type projects, sustainable agriculture, vertical farming, a lot of other areas where there's potential for higher return in the long term. Okay, last two questions. Uh, from Rajiv Kohli in India. Sustainability. I fear the concept has not has gone out of the window with the increase in use of sanitization chemicals, cleaning solutions, the increase in washing in hotels, plus the increase in single use masks, facials, gloves. We're already seeing mountains of this in India. So I see sustainability taking a back seat for the short to medium term. Your thoughts? Yes, that worries me too. But um, I think the next wave of this is where we start to find more sustainable ways of of recycling that, making those things out of recyclable materials, uh, finding um, more bio-friendly sanitization uh, and chemical solutions. That'll all come. There's been a rush to just buy whatever, but I think those smarter solutions um, will come over time. And I just think there's such a pressure from the marketplace now to protect our planet, and it will just get stronger and stronger, particularly from younger generations that we would be foolish to ignore that for the long term. Uh, and, and that could be our next big shock, you know, particularly the climate. You know, so many people are saying that, you know, the next big shock is climate, and this is just a dress rehearsal for it. Uh, and that would be a terrible, terrible shame. Okay, let me try, try and find... Um, um, from Mike Tablet, uh, Mike Tablet uh, from the Speakers Bureau. Uh, will speakers become more important to attract attendances with virtual events? Yes, I, I mean, I, I, I would say that as a speaker, but I think what's very clear is if you have really good speakers who are really tailoring what they have to the audience that are coming, that is going to make a huge difference. So, you know, what we know is that when we announce an event, uh, the bookings are relatively slow until we announce who the full panel are. And then when people see that they can get access to the kind of people that are coming, that they wouldn't, they would only have to, you know, travel across the world to get to for a conference. But now these people are willing to give up for an hour or two from their desk to take part. It really makes a difference. So, for example, our AI event on Thursday, we've managed to assemble a panel of people who I couldn't in my wildest of dreams have got to a physical event. But they're coming because they want to see who, what each other have got to say. They're willing to give up two hours in their day to do it. And, and, you know, we've got a nice design that allows them to really share their thoughts. So I think when you have that kind of thing and when you have really interesting people with really interesting views, then the world is going to still be a path to your door. Uh, i tell you what, we've only got two questions, three questions left. So I'm going to just rattle through these. Uh, you guys have the choice of staying or going. Uh, Xian Yong, do you see until the panel will signal the death of invest? Oh, we've done that. Okay. So we've got one question left. You get the last question, Mihai. Mihai Dino asks, is this a good timing for the disruptive technologies to scale up? Are we, for example, looking at the end of an era of the workforce traditional model, for example, getting rid of repetitive work that has mental health effects according to specialists? Yes, I mean, we are seeing growing use of robotic process automation and hyper-automation 
replacing humans in many tasks or automating the tasks. And the interesting thing there is that the humans themselves are automating their own tasks. So you're kind of ensuring that the, the task will be done the right way. I think we are gonna see more automation, but there's still a huge chunk of us that like humans. We like to interact with humans. We like to get to a human to solve our problems. So there's always gonna be a need for that. We also want human delivery of services. Whilst it's fun to have a robot bring me my towels and soap in a hotel, I also like talking to the people. I like the idea of spending my money to create jobs for people. I like the idea of going to a concert and seeing humans who with all their, their incredible talents and their human frailty so that they're never gonna perform the same piece twice versus watching a robot doing it exactly the same way unless it's you know, learned how to adapt every single time to be slightly different. But I don't wanna watch that robot for more than about two minutes. So I think we will see a growth in automation but we're also going to see a significant uh, rise, I think, in more human jobs and a lot of effort going into working out how do we create the skills to let people do the higher end jobs in the emerging industries that are more technology uh, heavy, if you like, and are more tech heavy. So thank you all for coming uh, and thank you all of you who've stayed on till the bitter end. That's incredible. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, do sign up for the newsletter. Uh, do buy the book if uh, you want. Do tell everyone you know about the book. Uh, we'll send you the video on Monday and a link to download the report. Uh, have a fantastic rest of the week and weekend and uh, a viable and um, sustainable future. Thank you.